How many of you have heard about that trend going exploding all over the internet about uh, Australia when they mention about the New World Order? I don't know if you've heard about that. So it was uh, the person, I think it was a healthcare worker or something like that, basically uh, said plainly about uh, New World Order uh, when they go through the neck, when they take the next steps of medical procedures for Australia, and that just hit viral, and then a lot of the news, they try to cover the tracks. The critics pointed out that they misconstrued it. Uh, obviously, you hear that from the critics, right? They always say that it's been misconstrued and that uh, people did not really understand uh, what the term is. But what I want to uh, lead to concerning about that big uh, controversy that exploded when she mentioned about Australia, uh, the next medical procedure steps that they're taking, and this is all for the New World Order system. What the critics pointed out as being misconstrued, I'm going to point out some scriptural passages that might be interesting with Australia's tie and the Antichrist. So whether she meant to use it or not for the globalist elitist agenda, that's not what I'm getting at over here. What I'm getting at is... Australia's connection with other countries, and they dubbed it the D10. And basically, 10 nations or 10 kings, so to speak, that they're going to be tied to. And this is all in plan in the Bible, all right, for the New World Order system. So I'm not covering the New World Order from what that lady's speaking about, whatever she meant it in her context, in her mind. I'm not interested in that. But what I'm interested in is the Antichrist New World Order system, which we know is fulfilled by Scripture, and then what nations are preparing and paving a way for it. And since Australia mentioned that term, sometimes it makes me wonder about what those people have in mind of what a new world order system would look like. And then when we compare it with scripture, it could be something where it's going to be more fulfilling prophecy than you think. Now, uh, some interesting articles here about the D10. The D10 is something that's supposed to uh, be a better replacement for the G7, okay? Okay. Now, the G7 is something that was started out long ago, and they comprised it of uh, 10 different nations. Uh, excuse me, they comprised it of seven nations, but then they start to add uh, three more here. They start to add three more different nations to this D10. So this was started uh, by the Atlantic Council, for some of you who don't know. So it was started by the Atlantic Council. And then the Atlantic Council, they took uh, seven, they had seven different nations who were involved in that. And with these seven different nations involved, then they added three more. And what they did to make it more inclusive, they want to make this more inclusive. So what they did by adding three more nations is to include the Pacific here. That way it's not just, uh, that's way it's not only concentrated toward the Atlantic side. So they want to be inclusive of the Pacific. So here are the following of the 10 so-called, let's, let's term it as kings, okay, for now, like we might see in the Bible. So the G7 countries are included here, which is UK. So let's put out the West here. So one, UK, two, US, three would be Italy, Four, Germany. Five, Emmanuel Macron is the Antichrist, France. <laughs> so obviously France will play a part. Obviously I'm not saying he is the Antichrist, but with some people who kind of have suspicions that he might be, it wouldn't be a surprise then that France would ha have to play a role for future end times if he turns out to be that uh, wicked one that the Bible would prophesy. We also have Japan and Canada. So we got the Pacific here now. Japan. Put, uh, 
you know what I'll do right here I'll put six here for Canada it's not a surprise Canada would be included over here very socialist mindset these people are left-wingers so obviously let's include these guys and then Japan is over here then they started to include Australia now Australia is very unique I'm gonna put them here okay it's unique, and I'll explain a little bit later why Australia would be unique. Six, seven, and then we cover, believe it or not, South Korea is also included here. And then obviously a big player is India. Obviously they'll have to be included here. Eight, nine, ten. Could these nations pave the way toward the future ten kings that the Bible will predict for the end times? Let's look at some interesting cases here about uh, these countries. So let's cover one at a time here. We're going to first look at Revelation chapter 17. Let's look at several signs here. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 17. And then we'll look at verse 12, Revelation chapter 17, and then we'll read verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So it has interesting wording here. It shows here these are not literal kings or literal kingdoms. Now we don't live in a, uh, we live in a day and age where they proclaim it's not an authoritarianism style. That's what the D10 is formed. It's formed so that it can stamp out authoritarianism, and they, try to, they like to put Trump as a part of that one. They claim it's all about democracy, democracy, to spread out democracy. And that's the reason why Revelation chapter 17, verse 12, it would show it's not like an authoritarian power, but it is nevertheless an authoritarian power that they have. Isn't that what it says? They ha they're not like literally kings or kingdoms, but they receive power like they are, like they're kings. Isn't that today so-called democracy? It's not democracy, it's socialism. And it's the, greater than that, it's communism. Greater than that, it's Satanism, what they're paving a way for. The way you blind the people, how dictators have always blinded the mass the masses throughout history, is to proclaim, I'm for your side, I'm for your rights. It's always to claim that, but it's to disguise, it's a lie. Now, D10, for some of you who don't know, it's worded that way because what they like to promote is democracies. That's the idea. So I'm not really sure exactly what the letter D and 10 is supposed to mean, but I do know that one of the meanings behind it is because there are 10 nations who are trying to promote democracies. That's the idea. You get these 10 satanic kings, you think that they're going to go later in the future, that uh, we're going to be in control of your lives and be miserable? No, they're going to use the disguise of we're on your side. We're for peace. We're trying to protect the people. It's for the people. That's why government should have more control. It's for the people, the people. This is called democracy. No, that's socialism, you bunch of liars. That's called socialism. And then we're going to look at Daniel chapter... Uh, I want you to turn to Revelation 13 now. Revelation 13. And then I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 7. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 13. And I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 7. All right. Uh, can I have my bag, please? Can I have my bag, please? I left a note over there, which I forgot to take out. All right, thank you so much. Now, uh, as I'm going down, going invisible right here, hold on one moment. Here we are. All right. So, uh, the Atlantic council, as they would like to word themselves, it's because of the transatlantic, that's the idea, of the nations intermingling, trying to build up their system, their kingdom, to make it a more prosperous democracy, and blah, 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 blah. But for some of you who don't know, uh, this has a belief 
believe it or not. You can even look it up. They call themselves Ant Atlanticists or Atlanticism. For some of you who didn't know that. The people who started the, the origins of, its, uh, pred, uh, of the person behind the D10, which is the G7, the Atlantic Council, they believe in Atlanticism, they called it. Now, that should spark red flags for you. You might say, why is that? For some of you who don't realize this, Atlanticism, if you look at uh, the more older works in literature, there were people who were fascinated with the, sit the lost city of Atlantis. So notice the close wording here, right? They were so interested by the lost city of Atlantis that they also called it by the same term, Atlanticism, for some of you who didn't know that, or Atlanticist. They'll say Atlantean sometimes, but you'll sometimes see this term. And there's no doubt that you'll see this interchanging thing where people will put uh, Atlantis' belief with Atlanticism, which is what the Atlantic Council did with their uh, G7 that tried to later evolve or turn into the D10 that we're looking at. Now, here is one example of one of their works. So one of their works here is actually called Atlantis Lost. That's the title of one of the works here. This is from Amsterdam University Press, uh, and they published it in 2010. And in this book, it says, During the 1960s, Charles de Gaulle's greatest quarrel was with the Americans. The American attitude towards this forceful European leader was, however, an equally defining part of the dispute. In this riveting study of transatlantic international relations, Sebastian Rain traces American responses to de Gaulle's foreign policy from 1958 to 1969, concluding that how Americans judged de Gaulle depended largely on whether their politics leaned to the left or to the right. And then uh, Sebastian uh, Rain is the one who wrote the book, and he's actually a senior civil servant at the Dutch Ministry of Defense. So with this uh, spectacular work that was prized by universities, it is interesting that when they start to uh, investigate and to examine Atlanticism, which is what the transatlantic uh, interactions at the Atlantic Council through the D10 that they're promoting, that they would see it as an interchangeable word with Atlantis. And they would try to assimilate that with the lost city of Atlantis. And if that's, I see this as very, very coincidental, which kind of matches, uh, I see more of a spiritual pattern here. Why do they symbolize it as Atlantis? Why do they want to do it that way? If you know history, occultists have always worked through symbols and metaphor and phrases that they would use it as. So let's look at one occultist who wanted, who believed and predicted Atlantis would be revived in the future. The lost city of Atlantis would be revived in the future. So what she believed, this is from Helen Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society. A lot of people have studied concerning about globalism and globalists. And by the way, the Atlanticists here, they dub themselves unashamed, unashamedly as globalism and globalists right here. So let's see what she reads here. We are at the close of the cycle of 5,000 years of the present Aryan Kali Yuga or Dark Age. This will be succeeded by an age of light. Even now under our very eyes, the new race or races are preparing to be formed. New race or races. But right here, we're all supposed to be not racist, right? These ten nations, we're supposed to be equality-minded. So how do you get a new race? Uh, maybe, you know, all different nationalities go something like that, you know. And then the other people who don't really do it, you know, they're the ones that's considered to be out of the picture or extinct. And then you see a similar pattern throughout history where... There was a certain people who didn't follow the program that they became extinct and wiped out. You study history, like Hitler, for example. 
Well, anyway, but what men learn from history is that what? Men never learn from history. So you need this new, uh, they don't want to use the word race, but that's what it basically is, a new group of people. That's the idea. New group of people that replace the others. Are preparing to be formed. Yeah, we're seeing it now. It's, it, we're seeing that division way more. And they're being more specific now. They're, they're calling it as white Christians. They're aiming toward the evangelical Christian churches. See, they're really aiming toward that. The distinction is being prepared now. According to Blavatsky, that was her dream, right? That she predicted. New race or races are preparing to be formed. And that is in America that the transformation will take place. That's what she's saying. It's all in America that this transformation is going to happen. And has already silently commenced. Ooh. So they, she claimed during her days it was already silently commencing it. They're launching their plans all this time. This race will be altered in mentality and move toward a more perfect spiritual existence that the periodical sinking and reappearance, reappearance of mighty continents now called Atlantean and Lemurian by modern writers is not fiction, will be demonstrated. So she's saying that this lost city of Atlantis will be revived through this new civilization, this new race that will replace the old ones that we're currently going through. She calls it Atlantis. These people are for Atlanticism to produce that kind of new world system, a better society. See that? Let's keep reading here. It is only in the 20th century that portions, if not the whole of the present work, will be vindicated. A world destruction as happened to Atlantis 11,000 years ago. Instead of Atlantis, this is what she prophesied, all of England and parts of new Western Europe, European coast will sink into the sea. In contrast, the sunken Azores region, the Isle of Poseidonis, will again be raised from the sea. She's talking about Atlantis. It's going to replace the current uh, government and nations. Atlantis will be the one to take it over. Lemuria was destroyed by fire. Atlantis was destroyed by water. The flood and the destruction of the fourth race and of the last antediluvian monster animals. So could it be, could it be that with this Atlanticism, civilization and society and age, new world order that they want to produce, this new order would replace the current structures that our current nations are going through. By let's unite and be inclusive together, that way we can improve our own uh, current civilizations that we messed up on. Let's enter a new era, a new age. Blavatsky called it Atlantis. These people called it Atlanticism. Now I wonder if the devils the devil's belief and ideology of ancient Atlantis is kind of similar to the current Atlantic Council with their uh, D10. Well, they have 10 kings over here that they set up. Atlantis, it is said, had 10 kings. What? Yep. You didn't know that? Atlantis, when it fell had 10 kings. Whoa. This is from one of the quotes. Plato's symbolic dialogue on ancient Atlantis. All right. C-R-I-T-I-A-S. He mentions here, from a careful consideration of Plato's description of Atlantis, it is evident that the story should not be regarded as wholly historical, but rather as both allegorical and historical. Origin, Porphyry, Proclus, Iamblichus, and Syrianus realized that the story concealed a profound philosophical mystery, but they disagreed as to the actual interpretation. Plato's Atlantis symbolizes the threefold nature of both the universe and the human body, the ten kings of Atlantis are the tetractes or numbers which are born as five pairs of opposites. You didn't know that, huh? Here's a work from uh, Leon Normont and Chevalier, A Manual of the Ancient History of the East. 
Okay, what did they say? Uh, they mentioned uh, in their ancient work that there were actually 10 kings, they said. There were 10 kings in Atlantis. And what they mention about these 10 kings, which is fascinating, is seemed to match up with a lot of things of uh, Brahmanism with their uh, nine, I guess they had these kings or sages, and they compare that with all the other cultures, which is intensely, uh, you can either say fascinating, horrifying, or whatever word you want to use. But if you look at their work, they mention about 10 kings, and they give the name of these 10 kings for the lost city of Atlantis. So the lost city of Atlantis, do we see some... What's that? Okay, thank you so much. All right, so we see right here that in the lost city of Atlantis, why are some of the, its ideologies here or some of its factors or stories is getting revived later on? Could there be a master behind the scenes who has a spiritual, who has a spiritual purpose behind everything? Could it be more of a spiritual plane and working behind everything they go for? Even if they say that, well, this is not deliberate, they're not trying to revive the lost city of Atlantis, it doesn't change the fact that you made it worse. Even if it's not deliberate, then it proves more that it's not physical. There was something spiritual behind all of that. And that just makes things worse then. Why? They all probably followed the same father. You have your, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. There's something you don't want to do is do something that's coincidental, that seemed to match with what the devil did a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. All right? Then you might as well be, say that these people are probably demon-possessed then, maybe. I won't go that far for now, but I'm trying to point out some good reasons here to think, to make you think. Now, isn't that crazy about Atlantis and about their ten kings? And what did the Bible say? Ten kings. Ten kings come out. And guess what? They rise up out of the sea. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Look at this. The Bible says, uh, Daniel spake in verse 2 and said, I saw my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea. So something comes out of the sea. Who are they? Verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had what? Ten horns. Ten kings come out, out of the sea. Blavatsky predicted Atlantis would revive out of the sea again in the future. And guess what? They claimed the Atlantis story. There were ten kings who went down under the sea. Whoa, now you read that in your Bible, okay? You read that in your Bible. Let me show some other interesting factors here. Let's uh, keep your hand at Revelation 13, Daniel 7, and I want you to go to Daniel 2. Daniel 2. You know what I find interesting in Daniel chapter 2? We see the image here of Nebuchadnezzar. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the image... We see the empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the ten kings at the bottom. They're the toes. But you know what's intensely interesting? When Jesus Christ is that stone that knocks down the image, he hits the ten toes, right? When he hits the ten toes, isn't it interesting that the Bible says the entire image fell? What does that mean? Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome were not destroyed then yet they're destroyed when the ten kings get destroyed what am i pointing out here it didn't ancient babylon ancient persia ancient greece ancient rome fell yeah you're right the ancient kingdoms fell but god didn't see them as destroyed why because he sees the prince behind it the spirits behind these kingdoms and he sees the spirit behind these kingdoms carrying on through the devil 
You want proof text of that one? We don't have time, all right? I, I, I'm not going to look at all these verses. Daniel 10, Satan is called the Prince of Persia. Daniel chapter 8, the Antichrist is likened to the king of Grecia. Rome revived, why? Revelation 17. The woman rides these ten horns and she's called city uh, on what? Seven mountains. What's the city on seven hills? Of, seven hills, Rome. And then not only that, the Bible calls her Mystery Babylon. See, God sees the spiritual power behind these kingdoms continuing. So that means then that the spiritual power behind Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome has to continue with these ten kings until Jesus comes. Because Daniel chapter 2, notice right here, the Bible says in verse 44, in the days of these kings, it's referring to... Uh, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall be, not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume what? All these kingdoms that Daniel talked about Babylon, Persia, Rome, the ten kings and it shall stand forever. How about that? Look at right here. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that in break in pieces, see that? The iron, Rome, the brass, Greece, the clay, the silver, Persia, and the gold, Babylon. See, it comes when Jesus comes in the future. But uh, if that's the case, then go to Daniel 7 then. Daniel 7. Isn't it interesting? So all Bible prophecy scholars will admit Daniel chapter 7 verse 7 is the Antichrist kingdom. Okay? They're all to agree with that. All Bible prophecy scholars will agree Daniel chapter 7 verse 7 is the uh, Antichrist kingdom. But look, who, the Antichrist kingdom, look what he carries. Verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces. Uh, let's, and it was what? Diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Okay, so there's this fourth beast. That came out. So a lot of you already know this, but let me break it down for the people online who don't know. Okay, Fourth beast that comes out is diverse from all the beasts before it. All right. It's a diversity of all of them. See that? It contains... It's a fourth beast. So all the other beasts behind it. Third, second, and first beast. Meaning it's a, it's a conglomeration of them. What is the first, second, and third beast then? All right. Look at the verse. Verse 4, lion, right? That's the first beast, lion. Second, the next verse shows is bear, right? If we look at verse 5, bear. Verse 6, leopard, right? Leopard. Now, Will the Antichrist kingdom consist of all these other three kingdoms? Yes, Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Now, you're going to hear from people that these three beasts are referring to uh, Persia, Greece, and Rome. All right? Uh, some might include Babylon here, but uh, let's say, that way everyone can agree with over here, the point is, they included these kingdoms, these ancient kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, all right? That's the bottom line. The bottom line is, they included these kingdoms here. The fourth beast is comprised of all these kingdoms. So, remember, the fourth beast is the Antichrist kingdom, right? I said that quite often. All right. If the fourth beast is the Antichrist kingdom, he's supposed to comprise the ancient kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, and... Uh, Rome, okay, in Greece. Wait, that explains Daniel 2 image. Why Jesus Christ, he knocks down the Antichrist kingdom of his ten kings. It's going to knock down these uh, Babylon, Persian, Greece, Roman empires as well. Why? Because the Antichrist will carry those kingdoms with him. Greece, Persia, and Roman. He's going to carry that kingdom with him. Let's look at the evidence here, okay? So if these three animals are referring to Persia, Greece, Rome, and Babylon, 
Will the Antichrist carry these animal kingdoms? Yes, Revelation 13, look at this. Verse 2, and the beast, that's the Antichrist, right? At verse 1, ten horns come up out of the sea, like Atlantis with its ten kings coming out of the sea, right? The Antichrist is carrying that. Look what he comprised of, verse 2. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. Boom, right there, right there. He carried these kingdoms. Okay, so then if the Antichrist consists of these three kingdoms that the Bible warned about, the question then is, all right, if the Antichrist is carrying on the spirit of these kingdoms, Babylon, Greece, Rome, and Persia, in modern today's world, what would those kingdoms be? All right, the first example right here is that griffin, all right, the lion with eagle's wings. And then that's pretty obvious then what, what would carry that. It would be England, all right? It would be England. And not only that, it matches, people say the first one is Persia. If that's the case, that it is Persia, then remember Persia was the one that tried to restore the land to the Jews, right? Who is the country and the nation that was responsible for trying to give the nation of Israel their land, England. So that's the reason why the first one right here is England. Now notice what the Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 2. What if its country, its mouthpiece is England? You notice that? The mouth is the mouth of a what? Lion, right? Mouth of a lion. What if the nation of England is the mouthpiece of this ten federated kingdom of the Antichrist? Is that the case? Well, let's look at the D10. You know who was the mouthpiece? Who started it? Boris Johnson. England. You didn't know that, did you? How about that? Uh, he was the one that tried to do it. This is uh, from the Mint title of their article, UK plans uh, new, new 5G club of 10 democracies, including India. They write over here, the British government has approached the US with the prospect of creating a 5G club of 10 democracies, including India. How about that? So notice that England was the mouthpiece here. It says right here, this is another article from The Guardian. Title, UK plans early G7 virtual meeting and presses ahead with switch to D10. And then one of the quotes here reads, it goes without saying that Prime Minister Johnson will not fail to prepare an agenda for the G7 so that people don't get confused. Remember, the old name for D10 or the or why the reason why they evolved to D10 was because originally the plan and focus was G7, okay? But now people are trying to go to evolve toward this route, all right? So basically, new plan, old plan, all right? They're all connected. All right, so uh, let me keep reading here. Uh, Prime Minister Johnson will not fail to prepare an agenda for the G7 likely to please the Americans, thus including a pro-democracy dimension. Let us not be surprised, moreover, if London tries to exploit the exercise for the benefit of global Britain by seeking in practice to downgrade the place of the European Union. So uh, UK is the mouthpiece uh, rushing and uh, starting up the nations together. But it is interesting that it seems to be something where it might downgrade the European Union. Would it in the future, the D10 downplay the European Union in some way? Well, uh, the European Union, did you read some of the interesting quotations about it? One of the people who would be the emergency religious leader that the European Union would turn to is the Pope, for some of you who didn't know that. Wow. Didn't you know the D10, excuse me, scratch that out, the Ten Kings turn against the Roman Catholic Empire and burn her to the ground. Could Johnson be preparing a way for that one? I don't know, but if you read Revelation 17, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it. Revelation 17, what do they do with the Roman Catholic whore? The Bible says, Revelation chapter 17, verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, 
These shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Interesting stuff there. Now, if we were to continue reading on, Revelation 13, the next beast is the bear, right? Okay, so we got England here. The second beast, who would it be? Russia would match up well. You might say, why would it match up well with Russia? Because uh, one of its uh, primary uh, symbols where they would, they say, would march to conquer and crush the nations, they would say the feet of a bear. It would march on as a bear to crush the nations. Revelation 13, 2 says, His feet were as the feet of a bear. How about that? Wait a minute, but pastor, you didn't put Russia over here. So why would Russia be included? Oh, I got two interesting things here that you didn't know about, all right? Two interesting things that you didn't know about was, didn't you know that uh, Trump, what he did back then, the title of the article is Time for the D10 to Replace the G7 by the Strategist. They said here that Trump tried to invite and include, he wanted to invite, it says here, although Trump also said he wanted to invite Moscow. How about that? They want to include Russia over here. They got the G7, but there's another organization that you probably don't know called the G20, and that is inclusive of Russia. So then it is possible in the future they might include Russia here. Or if you studied about the D10's purpose, you know what their purpose was? The whole agenda behind it was their outright concern of Russia and China. Russia and China. So they were very scared about what Russia would do and what China would do. So then, what is interesting in one of the articles here, and this is by the Atlantic Council website itself, all right, the guys who started everything. It's called the D10, uh, D10 Strategy Forum. And what they wrote at the bottom here, D10 think tanks experts outline a comprehensive strategy to counter Russia's challenge to the rules based democratic order. So if you read articles from The Hill, it is very interesting when The Hill mentions about the G7 or the D10, they mention that they have to put more forceful measures if they're going to go against Russia and China. Why, if they're going to counter Russia's marching as a bear, what are they going to have to do? They have to march like Russia as the feet of a bear. And that's why Dr. Ruckman mentioned here that the Antichrist kingdom, it's going to march like the communist nation of Russia. Now, I know that some of you people say, no, Russia is not communist, but look, you're laughable, okay? Even the politicians, even the Democrats themselves, they would, uh, they would associate communism with Russia today. Why? Because even though the name and the term itself is, not, is dead in Russia today, the movement and its ideology, very much alive, especially if you study, study Russia right now, how they're doing with their movement. So it's moving like Russia. They're moving like Russia. But let me show you something else that's also interesting, is that they definitely have to put a lot more forceful measure. And when they put a lot more forceful measure, uh, I want you to go to Daniel chapter 7 again. Daniel chapter 7. This is from the article from the Washington Post. An emerging new alliance of democracies. See, they call this democracies for D10. But you know what they said? They said that the idealism, what they're concerned about, skeptics contend that such idealism may still lack teeth. That's what they called it. You know what the Antichrist kingdom has to have? Teeth. That would crush its nations. Stronger teeth. Look at Daniel 7. Daniel 7, man, it's crazy, huh? Man, that scripture, man, that scripture is something else. Look at Daniel chapter 7, and this Antichrist beast at verse 7, look at the middle of verse 7. Dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, right? Because they have to be stronger than Russia and China if that's what the D10's purpose is. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces. Here's your feet 
and stamp the residue with the feet of it. There's your feet of a bear. Man, that scripture's more alive than you think. Amen. That scripture's more alive than you think. How about that? And who told you that Bible study was boring? I always like to say that. Who told you that the Bible study was so boring? All right, you're boring. That's your problem. You don't study the Bible. Now let's talk about the third beast. The third beast, where Dr. Ruckman mentioned, it would be America. Now I'm not going to go through a huge defensive format. All right, let's just take it as it is. Okay. So America, the reason why some of the things would match up with the leopard is because Revelation 13 shows the whole body is the body of a leopard, right, at verse 2. So the main body that is needed for this ten kingdom is a leopard. Now notice that the leopard is an integrated beast where it would have black spots, a white belly, and yellow skin. And that covers all nationalities right there, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The melting pot country in all of history and in the world is undoubtedly, is undoubtedly America. So America is undoubtedly, America is undoubtedly the melting pot that consists of all uh, nationalities there. And it is undoubtedly the main body that these ten kingdoms have to rely upon. If there's one nation the whole world's looking at, it's America. That's the main body that moves everything. And several articles will definitely demonstrate it with the D10, which is pretty obvious. So uh, what they're all waiting for is Biden, you know, until he wakes up out of his sleep, I guess, you know, <laughs> because he's uh, uh, that guy, such a reliable president, isn't he? Everybody's waiting for him to give the command and the order. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So then there are so many, if you read all these articles from the Hill, they would mention over here that everybody's waiting for a word from Biden about the D10, about its movement. And uh, in order for it to march on, they would rely on America. So it looks like that the articles from the Hill here, it looked like that uh, it got uh, deleted here or, or I lost it. Uh, rats. I used to have it all here. Uh, it's not here. Okay, that's lame. But anyways, well, that's lame. Okay, but uh, all you have to do is uh, uh, look at the Hill, the Hill newspaper I read where they mentioned that they're waiting for Biden and for his strategy and for America to move. The D-10 is waiting for America to do its movement. It's the main body, undoubtedly, for the D-10. And a lot of the origins of the Atlantic Council and their treaty and everything, a lot of it is empowered by America, for some of you who didn't know, and the origins of the Atlantic Council. So there's no doubt America is the main body for it. So that's why the Antichrist 10 Kingdom, look at these three countries here. If you pay attention to these three countries, then there might be something the Antichrist could use in the future. Now, what does this all have to do with Australia? Well, Australia, uh, the, the, the world is waiting for them where they can try to include them because of why? The Pacific. These certain countries in the Pacific are being included. So Australia is one of the people where D10 they want to definitely establish relationship for the Pacific here. Why? Because of China. So if they get the Atlantic Ocean out of the West, they want the power in the Pacific as well. If they want the power in the Pacific, there is a huge island, so to speak. They call it the island continent. It's worded as island continent, and that's Australia. They want Australia. Now, does the Bible show that Australia, that it might have an involvement for the Antichrist 10 kingdom. Yes, look at the book of Isaiah. It's possible. I'm not saying it is, but it's very possible. Look at the book of Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. And now I want you, okay, so your hand can let go on all those passages now. So go to Isaiah 59, and then I want your uh, hand to also go to Revelation chapter uh, 16, Revelation 16. Go to Isaiah 59, and then I want you to turn to Revelation 16. Now, the Pacific, definitely, you have to keep your eyes over here. The Antichrist kingdom, he is going to involve the Pacific side. There is no doubt about that. Why? Because the Bible shows, interesting, 
that out of the east of Israel, east of Israel, there's going to be a huge number consisting of uh, probably, I think the number is about 200 million or something to that effect of soldiers coming from the east of Israel that the Antichrist is going to use to wipe out Israel. You can't get all those numbers unless you get it from China. That's why China would play a big part in the Antichrist kingdom. But these people, they're supposed to be, uh, they're supposed to summon the D10 that looks and appears as anti-China or anti-Russia. So then what's going on here? It could be, one, that China will relent and join the D10 somehow. Or two, you need more countries and nations. So then you're going to have to include bigger countries or nations out of the East to conglomerate together. And then you get Revelation 16 it comes out of the East. The Bible says Revelation chapter 16 Notice that the Bible reads here, verse 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings, plural, of the east, might be prepared. The Antichrist summons them at verse 14, what? To battle the Lord, to come together at verse 16, Armageddon, to Israel, verse 16. So if you're going to get all the kings around the east, Australia will definitely be inclusive. It will be inclusive. But it is very interesting that this is known as the island continent, okay? So people would say even though it would be located at an eastern hemisphere side, you know what they call this place? They still call this place the west, Would Australia be inclusive in Scripture in Revelation 16 about being in the eastern direction, but it's known as the island of the west? Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. What does the Bible say when he comes down to uh, judge the nations right here? When he judges the nations, he says, mm, verse 10, we grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. Uh, we look for judgment, but there is none. And then what does God do? He sends in judgment. He mentions right here at verse 16, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him, for he put on, uh, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and the helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments uh, of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Well, that's no doubt we can see clearly here. This is Jesus Christ at second advent, right, defending his nation of Israel. But look what the Bible says: what Jesus Christ, when he comes in arm again, and who he's judging. Verse 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the who? Islands he will repay recompense. Why will he do that? Because all these islands or even island continents, they're going to be involved with the Antichrist kingdom. But notice the wording here, what the Bible says. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the what? West. From the west. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says it's from the west, but then again, Revelation 16, it points out it's from the east. It could be pointing out right here, Australia. Tensely interesting when you look at the scriptures. Now, let's look at some other things about Australia's new world order and the ten kings that are all involved with that. If they have to uh, move against Russia and China, or the D10, they have to move like Russia, then we're going to see some big plays right here during the tribulation. Let's look at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. 
let's suppose that the 10 kings, it doesn't matter either or, it doesn't matter either or. The 10 kings, they can conglomerate with the red communists, all right, China, Russia, or they can, uh, or they can be against them, all right? They can be against the red communists. It doesn't matter either or, it's going to tie to end time prophecy, to what God has predicted on what's going to happen in the future. What's going to happen in the future is that red communism will have a play in end times. And they're going to slaughter nations and a lot of people will bleed. And that's the role of the D10. That's the role of the D10. Look at Revelation chapter 6. The Bible says at verse 4, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So whoever this red horseman is, the red horse is supposed to represent taking away peace. Wait a minute. The previous horse under the Antichrist is supposed to give peace. But guess what? Under the Antichrist kingdom, there is no peace. It's going to be war. So war is going to break out. Whether D10 don't get along with Russia and China, or Russia and China teams up with D10 and there's instability. It doesn't matter. Point is, is that the Antichrist kingdom is going to have uh, war. But the Bible calls it a red horse. So we have to identify this red horse. And then the red horse, I've, told, I've taught you in Revelation studies, it, can be in, it would show uh, one of the groups that definitely play a part in the tribulation is red communists. And it could be Russia or China or even both of them. You might say, why is that? Because the communist party, they dub themselves, their symbol is red. The countries, Russia or China, it don't matter, North Korea, etc. The symbol that majority have used throughout history, the history of communism, is red. That's why they had what they called the Red Scare or the Red Terror in America that time. Anything that was red. Even America's during the early days, they were scared about the red color. So they took that very seriously. There's no doubt. China mentioned about its flag. There's a Chinese cultural significance behind red. I think they tied it to Han Chinese Kingdom. But they also, the current government system, where Mao Zedong and the other communists played a major part, they said that red is supposed to represent, believe it or not, which matches with scripture, nations against each other. Like a civil war. You fight for your, what? Freedom. For communism. Revelation 6, verse 4, what's the red supposed to mean? Nation turning against each other, civil war, etc. See, that's communism. It matches perfectly well with communism. Russia, when they were communist back then, during the old days, and dubbed themselves Soviet Union and dubbed themselves communism, of course its ideology is not dead today, like I said, but back then when they uh, unashamedly called themselves communists, red was their color. Red was the symbol back then. So that is their role during the end times. If that's uh, their color, red, during the end times, and that's what the Antichrist has to play a part in, I wonder what it's supposed to mean. There's a lot of rich history, which I would encourage you, concerning about red and a lot of scary things. Uh, in Britannica, they have an article called Flag of China, and then uh, it mentions right here about red, where it is associated with the communists take over, where they shed a lot of blood. Do communists, are communists fully familiar with that? Do they really believe in that? Yes, let's look at one of their uh, favorite leaders, or not so favorite leaders, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin. Blood is in their blood, so to speak. It, death is in their veins to get power. He's, Joseph Stalin said, the Red Army, he called it Red, Red Army and Navy and the whole Soviet people must fight for every inch of Soviet soil. Fight to the last drop of blood for our towns and villages. Onward to victory. Here's another quote by Joseph Stalin. Great Britain provided time. The United States provided money. And Soviet Russia provided blood. That's what I said. Another quote from Joseph Stalin. One death is a tragedy. One million is a statistic. <laughs> it's crazy. 
So the, that is in their uh, very soul, so to speak, their very ideology. And that's what they're going to play. Now, uh, I better wrap this up real quickly. So in wrapping all of this up quickly, uh, it would fail for me to mention some more interesting things about the D10. You know what the point is? The point of doing this uh, D10, what they're greatly concerned about uh, with the D10, it's supposed to compete and go against China. Why? Because from the article from the print, UK wants 5G alliance. 5G. It's all 5G here, for some of you who didn't know. Alliance of 10 countries, including India, to avoid reliance on Chinese Huawei. So China has their own, uh, quote-unquote, 5G or technology, which they call Huawei. So it's trying to compete against that, which uh, right here. So then they wanted to, the D10 wanted to combine its nations in technology to compete in the 5G realm against China. So it was all concerning about 5G. You can read that too, which is intensely interesting here. Uh, let's see. Another one. Uh, well, when they do, uh, let's see here. I keep losing articles here. Okay. All right, I read this article title before, so let me read it again from The Mint. Title of the article, UK plans new 5G club of 10 democracies, including India, report. So it's interesting that they call this a 5G club. Isn't that interesting? Whatever this club that composes of who? How many? 10? He calls it 5G. Revelation 17. You know what Dr. Upman said, which was, uh, I thought that maybe he was exaggerating or he was dramatizing it, but it might be more truth here. He might really believe this. Those 10 kings, when they were going against battle in Jesus Christ, they had their antennas or their technology communicating with each other in high-tech mode. These 10 kings are what? 10 horns. And you're, you're way ahead, brother, right here. Look at verse 13. Verse 12, 10 horns of 10 kings, right? Kind of like their antenna or technology. Verse 13, these have what? One mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Isn't that interesting? It's supposed to share one mind here. Isn't that what technology is doing? Power here and strength as well. Isn't that interesting? But 5G is just too short of that. So China and uh, China and D10 is going to compete because they have a new thing coming out. Title from BBC News, China sends world's first 6G satellite. Wait a minute. Revelation 13, 6 is what? The number of the Antichrist. Whoa. Could they be using 666 to connect something? I'm not saying 5G is 666, but I'm pointing out here, all these are stepping stones to what is possible in Scripture, what the Antichrist can do. China sends world's first 6G test satellite into orbit. Did you study 6G? It's intensely interesting. Nature Electronics, what should 6G be? Well, guess what they do? With the uh, you ever seen these uh, sci-fi shows where you can click buttons over there and then you just move stuff? You thought you can do it on the screen, but now they're doing it on objects. And you could do it something on a wrist, probably. And then technology can pop out like a screen like that. But what's even more interesting, for some of you who didn't know about 6G, uh, I would encourage you to uh, watch this video. Uh, it's called 6G Vision for 2030. 2030 is the date, probably. When that time comes, oh, if there's a pre-tribulation rapture, and if there is, there is, amen? There is, we believe in that. And if it's three and a half years in the tribulation before the mark of the beast comes out, what if 2027 or 2026 in the middle is where we go up? 
But then 2030, they're going to, uh, their, their vision is to launch out what they call 6G. And guess what? A big play in this one is that they said they want to connect it with your body so that your mind can interact with the technology and play with it. And they also say this, they, want, they say AI is heavily involved in this, artificial intelligence. What did the Bible say? These all have what? One mind. Either China is going to conglomerate with these 10, or the 10 is going to battle out against China and the Antichrist is going to launch his 6G. Well, go home and pray about that for a while. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been mind-blowing and eye-opening to the people and that we can see Scripture truly fulfilled right before our eyes and we have faith and uh, no fear of tomorrow because we know what your word prophesied, Lord. So we already know what's going to happen. We just trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.